First time from Jay Adams. It's Kevin. Hello everybody. My name's Justin kirk -Bailey. I am a consultant intensivist and anaesthetist from Guildford. I am absolutely honoured this evening to be joined by two friends and also colleagues from the Intensive Care Society's FUSIC Committee, Ashley Miller and Marcus Pett. Tonight is the culmination of what has been a considerable amount of work from both of them and other members of the FUSIC Committee to deliver something called FUSIC HD which is, as they will explain, hemodynamics assessment using ultrasound. And for those of you who might be aware of it, it's also recently been published in JIX, the Journal of the Intensive Care Society. Without further ado, um, I will get them going, but please use the facilities on the webinar to be able to pop in some questions. And at the end of their presentations, I will be able to go through them and try and get them all answered for you by our expert speakers. So gentlemen, take it away. Thank you so much, Justin. It's great to have you on the team. Well, I thought I'd be introducing Ashley Miller today, my colleague and, uh, and co-chair of FUSIC and the best looking man in intensive care. I can't think of anyone else to stand shoulder to shoulder with and uh, give a presentation today about something that we spent little else in the last year uh, doing. I suppose we just start by going back a section to, to where this all began, which is back in 2010, a big European uh, collective of clever people got together and decided that, that focused echo could be a thing for intensive care. And shortly afterwards, the ICS hosted a meeting with all the different um, stakeholders and, and FICE was born along with ACCE, which I'll let um, Ashley talk a bit more about. But um, it was launched in 2012 and, and it's been running now for the best part of nine years plus. And, you know, we've come a long way and it's been timely, I think, to, to think about the next steps. So, uh, but it's not just FICE, actually. It's, um, it's QSIC and Ash was, was there, um, the chair. Ash, Ash, tell us a little bit about how, how QSIC began. Yeah, thanks, Marcus, and uh, thanks for that uh, flattering introduction. Uh, I have to say back to you that it's FICE that um, really inspired me in learning ultrasound, uh, you know, way back when. So uh, you've had a lot to do with that. So thanks. Uh, yeah, so so QSIC came along uh, in about 2016, I think, and uh, you know it was recognised that FICE was growing great guns. Um, but that there was a whole other world of ultrasound out there that was useful in intensive care that wasn't being catered for. So uh, we started up the uh, core ultrasound and intensive care uh, working group committee. And this mainly focused on lung ultrasound to start with, um, which is you know, one of the most important uses of ultrasound for critically ill patients. And... Uh, you know, we really modelled what FICE had done with uh, the kind of, you know, module creation and curriculum, the way it was all structured, um, you know, because a lot of that hard work had been done for us. Um, yeah, so we concentrated on quite a, um, you know, extensive lung ultrasound module. We brought in a bit of uh, abdomen, some vascular access. Um, and over time, over the last few years, that's grown and we've now got quite a comprehensive offering um, because it was always really the vision that, uh, you know, our, our patients have complete bodies. And so you need to be able to ultrasound those whole bodies to come up with useful diagnoses and treatment strategies. Uh, so, you know, we've been developing uh, that over the years and uh then you know realizing that ultrasound should really be all one kind of thing then we got together with FICE and Marcus perhaps you want to uh, to take it yeah. from there yeah we sure we sure did um so FICE you know going back again one step to the beginning it was it was very simple and it had to be that way I think to to fly and um these are the five questions we still talk about today, which are, 
is an LV dilator and or significantly impaired? Is the RV dilator and or significantly impaired? Are there features of low venous return? We'll come back to that subject, I'm sure, a couple of times in this talk. But, you know, we, we perhaps started with, is, is there hypovolemia? But it's not quite as simple as that. Is there a pericardial effusion? And is there a pleural effusion? Now, th those things are simplistic and very, very important. And they, they're the big wins, we think, and still are. Um, but really, after about you know four or five years of FICE running, we saw more and more people taking it up and thinking, where is this going? And what, what are, what, where can we take these people? What's next? What is beyond FICE, or as we now call it, FISIC heart? And I think you know, we, we had some big discussions about that and, and, and what to do. And I think you know, these are just some of the diagnoses that are out there that matter to intensivists. And I, you, know, you can just pick your eyes down this list you know, left ventricular, right ventricular, filling pressure, right ventricular hypertrophy, suggesting chronic disease, bowel disease, aortic disease, not just of the root, but the abdom abdominal aorta as well. And, and, and other things, you know, um, right-sided problems, venous congestion, uh, and all, all of the others you can see. And also the, you know, the arterial side and the flow um, through the body is really important. And as intensivists, we need to know about this stuff. So we were thinking, what's next? And in and, and 2017, moving into 2018, um, the BSE released level one accreditation, and it's a very valid and worthy piece of um, training and, and a, a great accreditation system. And it's, it's flourishing. Um, the, 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 it's quite similar to FICE in terms of the content. It's FICE plus definitely an inclusion of valves, of the aortic valve and the mitral valve. And, and, and look at the aortic route. So it definitely achieves, you know, some of those goals, but um, it, it's, not, it's not all of the things that we need for intensive care. And up to this point, we've had two uh, uh, major training systems. Um, I've mentioned the ACCE uh, was born at the same time as FICE and, and has been very well established. In fact, um, Ashley Miller was the very first person, I think, when you asked to, uh, to become accredited in ACC. So why don't you take us through a little bit about that? Tell yes, us a bit so I did the um, ACC and how you see it. Yeah, I did the the pilot exam for this um, way back in. I can't even remember the year. A long time. <laughs> it was a long, long time ago. Um, 2010? 2010. Yeah, no, I, I think I was it next to you. We didn't yeah. know each other then, did we? But uh. no, yeah, it, it was 2010. Um, and I, I, you know, I'd been. I'd been working towards uh, level two echocardiography, um, you know, and echo outpatient stuff. So, you know, I went along and did the exam and it was the same exam as the standard TTE one. We just had uh, the last five MCQ questions had been made a bit more critical care focused and the, and the video exam was the same. Um, the logbook requirements, same number of scans, 250 scans. Um, slight different focus on what pathologies were needed and again five video cases just like the standard one um, but with a different case mix from the uh, from the standard TT accreditation um, and I think it's, it's probably fair to say the, exa the, the exams probably come on a way since then obviously that was a pilot exam I'm sure yeah, now it's yeah, a no, more I, comprehensive right absolutely and I used to be involved with uh, with setting mm. the exam I used to run the the, the video exam for the uh, ACCE um, and you know very much now so how does the, it how does it differ from sorry sorry mate i, I, yeah, I was no, just gonna say how does it differ yeah. from you know what we have yes yeah, so the the um the curriculum is is the same really as for for standard tt but has a more critical care focus but but really you know it's it's comprehensive echocardiography and you have to be able to do mm. everything every measurement that that exists for comprehensive echo and mm. you know some of those are really useful for intensive care but some of them some of them are not useful for intensive care um you know quantifying different grades of valve disease for example is not usually that useful in the critically ill patients and there's lots of other examples you can think of mm. as well um yeah there's uh, there's the european diploma in uh, advanced critical care echocardiography um which is quite similar to uh, the BSC level two. Um, the logbook requirements are a bit less. It's 150 uh, transthoracic scans and I think 35 uh, esophageal uh, echo scans. Um, 
but you know, quite similar. Yeah, they're both advanced echo programs, um, and you know, they'll, they'll both make you a really good echocardiographer. Yeah. So um, they both deal with high-end echocardiography, don't they? But do they do other things? Do they take into account any other aspects of ultrasound? Yeah. So they, I mean, they are their echo accreditation systems. So they're looking at the heart. Mm. They're looking at the pump. Yeah, yeah. It's obviously crucial in hemodynamics, yeah. but that's absolutely yeah. not the whole story. And that's something that we've tried to address as well. We're going yeah. to talk. Yeah. So, so I've got this. I'm not sure if you can see this here. And um, I've got my um, pictures of you guys over the top of the right hand side here. But I've, what 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 you should see is on the left, uh, FICE, Busic Heart, and on the right, um, BSE Level Two accreditation. Let's call it Level Two, generalizing ACC or and or uh, transthoracic. And um, where do you think Level One sits? Where does EDEC sit? And I, and I think in I'm going to put them here not to say that there aren't differences between them, but that there's more in common than apart, um, aside from perhaps some of the, the technical um, logbook numbers and so on. But what they're dealing with is broadly the, well, broadly similar. And, and I think what, the reason I put them like that is that there's this big, big gap in the middle. And for, for anyone who's at one end of this, the beginning, there's a big leap to the, the very advanced level of um, ultrasound and echocardiography pr practiced on the right side of the screen. And I think, um, you know, certainly Ash, you and I have been thinking about how to pitch this, where should we be? And, you know, I'll just say that, um, you know, traditionally there would be nothing in the middle. This, there would only be, certainly the, the Europeans would say it should all be very basic or very advanced. Um, and, and I think you and I both see the reasons for that, don't you? We, we've, um, we have, you know, have, have, had exposure to that, to advanced stuff. And I, I've learned, you know, how complicated it can be. But where do you think HD sits currently on this line, Ash? Where would you say it is? Yeah, how, so that is, a, that, question? that is a really interesting question. You know, for years, I thought about the, the gap in the middle here and thought, oh, the, you know, there should be something in, in the middle. And therefore, you're going to have to include more stuff from what's in the basic things, and you're going to have to take out some stuff that's in the advanced things, and end up with some something in the middle. But that's really not not the right way of looking at it. So, um, what you know, we had this idea that um, that's the wrong way of looking at things. What what you need in intensive care is to answer really important uh, clinical questions, and so the focus of Fusic hemodynamics is to be able to answer key clinical questions. And if those questions require some advanced level measurements, then so be it. But if those questions mean that there are some advanced level measurements that don't help you answer them, then there's no point learning how to do them. Um, the other interesting thing is that this line is a echocardiography line. So level two echo is clearly the most advanced comprehensive uh, yeah, accreditation system, but mm. you could have different lines. You, you know, this line could be uh, ultrasound in general, or this line could be clinical usefulness in intensive care. And then these things start to shift around a bit. So where would I put yeah. HD in that continuum? It depends what your line was and what your focus, what, you know, what your question is going to be. Uh, very, very clever answer. Very clever answer. You've evaded the question. You should be a politician. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I know what you're talking about. And, you know, I think maybe, should we let the, let the listeners make their own minds up on that? How about that? Maybe we could hear about that in the conversation later on. I'd love to hear uh, what other people's views are. Um, so look, it starts here at this. This is just to remind us that there are other modules, as Ash has already alluded to. These originated from FUSIC now, sorry, from, um, from um, QSIC and now um, our FUSIC modules all separate. You can interchange them as, and use, do, do them all. And of course, uh, FUSIC has become now, well, we're here to talk about FUSIC HD. And, and, and certainly the motivation that we had was to try to carefully bridge that gap for, for people who are already perhaps operating space um, without any governance structure around them 
and trying to bring them in and keeping them in in a a, a safe zone let's say uh, not trying to be a cardiologist not trying to uh, take over or avoid the need for further um, comprehensive echo but but trying to work around the, what what really matters in the middle of the night perhaps there aren't those sort of expert um, hands around and and to allow people to progress safely or as safely as possible into this zone and allow them to develop their own skill set within that kind of governance framework so those are the things that are embedded right the way through all of this stuff um, and here's where we reached and ash you know this is our this is our concept really that this can, you know advanced echo can be focused uh, around questions you just have to ask the right questions do you think we got the right questions ash well you know <laughs> i'm going to say yes aren't i because uh, that's that's what we came up with but um, uh, you know we spent a, we we obviously spent a long time on this didn't we we probably spent two years work on this um, I would say, yeah, and uh, yeah. and I, I, you know, we'll see if it stands the test of time. But uh, uh, I, 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 yeah. I, I do think they are the most important questions. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So let's take them through. Well, just before we get to the questions, just to remind us that there are some extra views to know in PCHD: two new parasternal views, two new apical views, one subcostal short, which some people would use in focused echo anyway and then some interesting aortic views which we'll come on to some of them modified from views that are well known in cardio uh, cardiology or echo cardiography but very rarely used for this reason so that's one of the things we found really exciting you can see the whole aorta from beginning to end uh, and of course the final bits are moving into below the diaphragm and into the right side of the venous um, structures of the body so I'm going to start with the first question. I'm going to deal with the first five. Shall, shall I actually do the second bunch? You see the from, from six to 10. Brilliant. Okay. So the first point really is, you know, can you identify uh, shock and can you identify a low uh, cardiac um, output? And interestingly, you think we would because we're intensivists, so we should. Uh, it's what we do every day. But actually, it turns out that the, the evidence for that is very minimal. In fact, if you go looking, you, you realize how bad we are. In fact, I found studies where the sensitivity for identifying low stroke volume was zero percent um, in the hands of critical care trained doctors and teams. So, so we aren't perhaps as good as we like to think we are. Um, we have monitors which can do that, but um, not all. Not they're not all available as and when and where you might need them, and that's one advantage that ultrasound has. It's so portable. Um, and to measure stroke volume, you need to know two things. One is um, the LVOT VTI or volume time integral relates to stroke distance. And if you'll excuse this video in the background uh, of me sort of showing, uh, demonstrating how to do this, you, well, well, we'll talk it through. You'll see me looking for an apical four chamber window and tilting the beam forwards to get the five chamber. That's the LVOT there and the aortic valve in the middle of the screen. Uh, that's just here. And you'll see me touching the screen in a moment and activating something called auto VTI, which is an amazing function on the venue, uh, the GE venue machine, which will find, seek the LVOT and measure. And you see in the top right hand corner of the, the, the screen there, that is a pulse wave Doppler trace of the um, LVOT. And that really performs well. And, and it, it's um, a function which I'm demonstrating the auto nature of it, but of course we can do this manually. And, um, and in, in addition to that, we need to have uh, to know the LVOT diameter. Now, this is a number that is used and squared in the equation. So any error here can really quite dramatically change that number uh, accordingly. I think you've got to be extremely careful. One of the things we'll be teaching on uh, HD courses is how to do this properly. Um, but you know, in practice, one an, an easy solution to avoid this is just not to measure it at all and just use your VTI as a surrogate of stroke volume and perhaps uh, how dynamic that might be, um, which, um, which, which really um, brings me on to the, to the next point really, which is the second question. If it's low, can we do something about it? And are we doing something in a beneficial way? So a FI study will tell you about um, volume tolerance. So if a heart might be contracting really well, empty and hyperdynamic, they're extremely um, willing to accept volume uh, and that's the right thing to do or a heart that is overloaded, uh, not contracting properly and under high pressure. So, so that kind of tolerance profile we can see from FICE 
the problem is the heart that's empty, hyperdynamic, uh, and perhaps even ejecting poorly, that, that person's heart can be, or system can be hypovolemic, or it can be vasoplegic. And it's very difficult to tell the difference on echo. And the course of treatment is usually quite different. So hypovolemia needs volume. Uh, what they don't need is vasopressors. And, uh, and the opposite is true, or at least um, uh, ideally. So, um, and there is a real risk of overloading patients and the harm that co is caused by that. So having an understanding of whether it's vasoplegia or whether it's hypovolemia is important. And um, in this case, you know, we, we know a lot about responsive uh, volume responsiveness. We, we use about that, that terminology in intensive care readily. Uh, but of course, um, to predict that um, using a mechanical ventilator and various parameters is quite hard because there are so many confounders that the actual conditions for that to be valid are usually quite rare, at least um, once you've got over the first few hours of a mechanically ventilated patient. So what you need to do is be able to see something that, that changes and is real um, and not predicted. And of course, you know, LVATVTI gives you that. Um, but of course, it's not just about volume that patients respond to. And actually, if you uh, have someone who's got vasoplegia and you give them vasopressors, you might increase the stroke volume if the volume load is, is appropriate, if the intravascular volume is appropriate. But of course, the opposite might be true is you might squeeze somebody to the point where their cardiac output drops. And that, that's one of the key things that bedside ultrasound can, can tell you. And of course, inotropic support, we can see the results of as well. The, the thing that we do see is this, is left ventricular ejection fraction. And it's used widely, the term, we, we know about it, we talk about it, we see it written in um, echo reports, but do we really understand it? And of course, there is a link between ejection fraction and stroke volume, and, 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 and LV ejection fraction is used to talk about it, LV function in patients who are sort of outpatient cardiology patients. The problem is that when you get critically ill, that the difference between those two things the links get stretched very in a complex way. So it's massively affected by preload and offload. A heart uh, that is struggling because of low volume inside it will have a high ejection fraction, but a low stroke volume potentially. And if you squeeze that patient, increasing their afterload, the stroke volume will drop like a stone. Um, so it's really important to know your um, um, preload and afterload when you're trying to link between ejection fraction and for instance, left ventricular function. The same is true in uh, patients on inotropes. So it's very common to have a, a comprehensive echo comes in and, and, and states that because of a normal ejection fraction, you've got normal LV function. But to miss the fact they're on inotropes uh, to achieve that normal, you know, misses the point that clearly they are is severely impaired. Another thing which we see a lot of is mitral regurgitation. And in, in MR, the heart should be hyperdynamic because more you know, fluids going out the front door and the back door. So the heart should be hyperdynamic. If you have significant MR and, and the LV ejection fraction is normal, the heart's probably impaired. So there are there's some interpretation issues which are important. And the last point here about left ventricular size, um, two hearts can look quite different, but deliver the same stroke volume. And here on the left is a hyperdynamic heart. It's a bit empty. Um, could be septic, you know, uh, uh, hyperdynamic. On the right, we've got a heart which is poorly contractile and dilated, and both of them could deliver the same stroke volume and same cardiac output. If you give the person on the left uh, positive inotropes, you're going to do them quite a significant harm. If you give the guy on the right a load of vasopressors, again, you know, going to have problems with flow. So they're really important, and, and HD will talk about how to in interpret um, ejection fraction properly knowing all of those hemodynamic factors. Question three, is the aorta abnormal? So on the top here, we've got a, a, an echo that's a normal healthy heart, the top right on the bottom left, if you can see it well, I'm sorry, it's the playback's a bit jerky, but we have a heart that's, um, uh, that's squeezing well, but I don't know if you can see what looks like the um, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, that's this here. Let me just uh, stop it for you, it might make it easier to see. In the middle of uh, diastole, the mitral, this is actually the mitral valve here, can you see? And um, this is a, this is a part of the LV, this is really an aortic root structure. And what we're seeing here is a terrible aortic dissection with probably free um, AR, which is the case if looking at color is quite difficult when there's such a high volume of regurgitation. But I just want you to know, just take a another last look at that 
if you can, in terms of playback. This is a um, severe aortic root dissection, and you only need to see this echo once in your life that you would, if you ever saw it again, you'd recognize it immediately. And this person had no diagnosis at the time, was um, uh, treated for sepsis and bilateral infiltrates. And I just want to share that wherever I can to, to show you that, that these things are sometimes very obvious and the right thing to do is, in, is ask for expert help, sometimes help outside your hospital and um, from a surgeon. The stepping away from the root here for a second, this is the, um, these are the kind of views which we use to look at the aorta. Uh, the first view is a, is a high parasitic log axis view, looking at the root. The second one here is the suprasternal view, um, looking down at the arch. The third view here on the right is a modified parasternal short axis. So that's just tilting the beam ever so slightly and rocking anteriorly. Uh, will bring in the aorta in a fantastic way, uh, as you can also with a modified aortic apical two chamber. And the final one on the right is the abdomen, abdominal aorta, um, well known to emergency medicine and also uh, should be well known to us after FISA HD. So is, are the major valves severely abnormal? We're not talking about uh, a little bit abnormal, really we're just trying to know. We, we know what normal looks like because we've done a lot of that through the FICE um, work and uh, for those people who are moving into HD they'll have done that already, they know what normal looks like. What we're looking for is severely abnormal and we're not trying to meet um, shades of grey. It's really important to, um, to understand that. And here's a, here's a picture of, again, top right normal, bottom left abnormal. <clears throat> this person's got, at first the heart looks kind of approximately okay and then you look at how small the aortic valve looks. Here it's tiny compared to this grossly enlarged left atrium, grossly enlarged right ventricular alpha tract. And then you look at this valve, this is the anterior leaflet, the mitral valve, and you compare it to the one at the top, the opening fully and straight. Although I'm sorry, the playback isn't great, but if you could, let me just, let me just freeze it for you for a minute. Whoops. Let me just freeze it for you for a minute and see if you can see. So the, it's thickened, it's not moving properly. And then you can see just there, there's a kind of what's called a hockey stick deformity. This person has mitral uh, stenosis. And rather than um, laboring the points here, if you, you might see that it says an echo free space between the two valves. And if you add color to it, you then get the diagnosis, which is clearly uh, huge amounts of um, regurgitation, both backwards and forwards into the LV showing mixed mitral um, valve disease. So you don't have to be a, a cardiologist to, to know that. Uh, color really helps. And Physic HD will talk about all of these valves, mostly in TD with a bit of added color uh, to, to be sure. And the only bit of spectral Doppler we use um, outside of pulse wave for the, the LVAT might be this. And this is looking through the LVAT and the aortic valve to show you that in continuous wave, you can sometimes have two traces here. There's a bright trace, which is according to the left ventricular outflow tract, and then a slightly darker trace that's taller, which is in, it's running through the aortic valve. And actually, the, if you take the, the peak of the small one and divide it by the peak of the big, big one, that's something called dimensionless index. It's something that's getting a lot of attention these days, not, not historically in all comprehensive reports. But what we know about this is it kind of almost corrects the body surface area, size, sex. Um, it also corrects for flow conditions quite well um, and possibly even angle of incidence because you're looking through the same valve um, both um, in the, uh, the LVOT and the outflow tract. So look, you know, dimensions index and uh, is a really useful, um, we think, uh, screen, screening tool for severe aortic stenosis. And the value to, to remember is 0.25. So it's less than 0.25, you've, you've got severe aortic stenosis. That's the only spectral doctor we'll do. And you won't see any of us grading valves and putting gradients across. That's just, that is, as, as Ash said, extremely complicated and way beyond uh, uh, our skill set in, in, in the HD territory. You really need to be a level three provider, I think, to do that. So question five, is there systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve? So um, again, apologies here if we have any jerky playback, but again, top right, normal, bottom left, very hypertrophic hearts, can you see? Um, contracting well to, such that the end systolic volume is very low and um, I'm going to stop it and I'm going to walk it through. So let's see if we can do that. I can bring that back. 
Excuse me. Excuse me, bear with me for a second. So, so as this is going back now, now this is going forward, so that as the ventricle shuts, the mitral valve closes, and then in, and you might see the tip of it bending upwards into the LV outflow tract. The, the aortic leaflets open for a short period of time, and then they close, and, and then we go back to diastole again. So this heart is, it's got obstruction because of the high velocity blood running out through the LVAT. And we know this because if you put color on, you see all this horrible green stuff, anything that's high velocity turbulent flow in this setting goes green. And you can see that all the way through into the, um, the aortic root. And actually also to, we put it over there, although it's not perfectly um, scaled, you see a lot of green activity in the, in the atrium, the left atrium, which you shouldn't, that's, um, it should be nice and black. This is a terrific MR consequent to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And this causes shock, probably is the kind of thing that we see in a heart that um, is hypertrophic. And then you have that sort of alpine anesthetic. I suspect that's what's, what's happening uh, intermittently in, in cases like that. Well, you've heard enough from me. So I'm gonna throw you now to Ashley to take you through the last five questions. So um, Ash, over to you, fellow. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Um... So we're, we're, yeah, we're going to go through the final five questions. And question number six is asking whether there's a regional wall motion abnormality. Now, any of you who have done FIST will know that, you know, you'll have touched on this already. So regional wall motion is really important for assessing LV function. And in FIST, you're taught to recognize a poorly functioning LV. And we teach as well that you should be looking for left ventricular wall thickening in systole. You know, the walls should thicken and move towards each other is a phrase I constantly trot out. Um, so you've already got an idea about looking at walls a bit and we're, we're just um, making that a bit more detailed uh, in HD. So we're learning to describe that wall motion a bit better so that's traditionally described into being normokinetic, uh, hypokinetic, akinetic, dyskinetic, and aneurysmal. And we're also uh, teaching and learning about the fact that, uh, you know, we know anyway uh, that different walls of the LV are supplied by different coronary arteries. And uh, you can look at pictures like this which show you which coronary arteries supply which bits of the left ventricle and that makes it if you, if you know this that makes it really useful to isolate regional wall motion abnormalities to coronary arteries so if you've got an acutely presenting patient or even a patient on your intensive care unit that um, you know deteriorates um, you're wondering if they've got some myocardial ischemia that they've had an acute mi uh, and they've got new regional wall motion abnormalities, that's going to be a really useful part of the diagnosis. Um, now, there's another really important diagnosis that's particularly relevant to critical care in regards to regional wall motion, and that is stress cardiomyopathy. And this is a really important diagnosis. So say you are a FICE practitioner, you're FICE positive, you put the probe on and you recognize somebody who's got really poor LV function. You know, usually that'll be just standard poor LV function, but it might be a stress cardiomyopathy. And if you don't recognize that, you might choose to start that patient on an inotrope. And that could potentially be disastrous for somebody with a stress cardiomyopathy, because uh, the last thing they need is more beta agonism. So I've got some uh, pictures here. And yeah, so it's, it's unfortunate they're not playing very well, but um, you can see in all the views, well, if it, the, the top left is a parasternal long axis and you can see that the base of the heart, just by the, um, uh, yeah, just by the mitral valve, closest to the mitral valve is contracting, but the other walls aren't. And then as we go down the LV in a short axis view at the mitral valve level, the walls are contracting reasonably well, but then as soon as you get past the valve leaflets to the mid LV, there's very little contraction happening. And you can see as well in the apical four chamber view, 
the base of the heart is contracting, but all the middle bit in the apex is not contracting. And this is classic, this is the classic appearance of Takotsubo cardio myopathy. And once you've seen this once, you'll always be looking out for it and you'll recognize this again. Now, any cardiologist will tell you that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you see this, you still have to suspect that it could have a coronary artery cause and the patient is almost certainly going to need some investigation of their coronary arteries, whatever the kind of angiography you want to do. Um, but it's really uh, good to have this as part of your differential and learn how to uh, recognize it. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Marcus? Thank you. So our next question is, are there features of raised left atrial pressure? And this is often the topic that people get most confused about when they're talking about or listening or learning about critical care echocardiography. And why is that? Well, the, there's, there's loads of stuff out there on uh, diastology and diastology and critical care. And you have to start off by remembering that all the measurements for the diastolic function are based on stable outpatients and they're really not validated in critically ill patients. You have to um, remember as well that these uh, patients who are being assessed um, on an outpatient basis, uh, they're having their left ventricles assessed to see if they've got diastolic function. And then if they have, that's going to be graded into mild, moderate, and severe. And this will um, you know, decide whether they've got heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or not. Now that's really important for outpatient heart failure management, but that's less important in critical care. And we can simplify this right down by saying what we're really thinking about here is just pulmonary edema. And that's why I've got that um, picture of the lung ultrasound on there, which showed pulmonary edema, lots of B lines on there. So the question is, you've got a patient with a lung ultrasound that looks like that, and you want to know why. So that scan was actually a COVID pneumonitis patient. So a few months ago, if that patient had come in to your intensive care unit, you could be pretty certain that it was COVID. But maybe if that patient came in today, with the prevalence being so much less, you 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 might well be thinking, well, is this heart failure, or you know, you might what you're really going to be thinking is, well, it could be either, and I need to distinguish between the two. So this is where ultrasound can help you. And. Uh, We've got a, an algorithm to go through for this. It's based on um, algorithms already out there. The, the, the British Society of Echocardiography and the American Society of Echocardiography have diastology algorithms, which this is based on. Um, but we think we've done this in a nice simplified way. And remember, we are not grading diastolic dysfunction. We're just asking the question, is left atrial pressure likely to be high? And we can do this quite simply, in fact. So the first step is to look for B lines on lung ultrasound, just as we saw in that previous picture. And then we can have a look at the left atrium. So if you see a left atrium in a four chamber view where the septum is bowed over into the right atrium throughout the cardiac cycle, then you don't need to go any further with the algorithm. It, you know that left atrial pressure is going to be high and that's going to be having a significant impact on the pulmonary edema that the patient has. Now, if you don't see that uh, left atrial septal bowing, you can go on and do some further uh, simple tests. Uh, next slide, Marcus. Oh yeah, okay, that, there we go. So we're going to assess something called the EA ratio. So we can uh, put some pulse wave Doppler at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets. And we're just looking at how the blood flows into the left ventricle. Um, we're looking at its velocity in early diastole and its velocity in uh, late diastole and comparing uh, those in a ratio. And uh, if it's very low, if the ratio is very low, then we can be pretty confident that left atrial pressure is gonna be low. 
And if that ratio is pretty high, then we can be pretty confident that the left atrial pressure is high as well. There are some couple of caveats to that. So young, fit people have left ventricles that relax really well. Uh, or uh, you know, older people, if they've got a hyperdynamic heart, um, you can get a high uh, EA ratio. So you have to be aware of that. If you're somewhere in the middle, or you've got a young fit patient, or you've got a patient with a hyperdynamic heart, and this part of the algorithm hasn't answered your question, there's a couple more measurements we can do, which might sound complicated initially, but they're, they're actually fairly straightforward. Uh, we should see those in the next slide. There we go. So if we're in that gray zone in the middle, we just need to look at three things. We need to look at left atrial size, and we've already had a look at that already to see if the uh, see what the left atrial uh, see what the interatrial septum is doing, and we can measure the velocity of any tricuspid regurg that's there, and we can do tissue Doppler of the medial and lateral mitral valve annulus, and that sounds quite fancy when you first come across it, but in fact you've already been shown how to do. Uh, TAPSI uh, with M mode. And this is no more difficult or technically challenging than measuring a TAPSI with M mode. You're just putting a, a tissue Doppler gate over the uh, muscle by the mitral valve and you're averaging the two values. Um, and then you divide uh, your E velocity by this tissue Doppler number that you get. Uh, and if there's two positive features, then it's like your pressure is likely to be high. If there's two negative features, it's likely to be low. Um, so yeah, it might sound complicated initially, but actually your question is going to be answered right at the beginning of the algorithm many times. And even if you're getting to this bit at the end, it's not too complicated uh, to pick up. And um, you know, it's really important to be able to uh, to know whether PA pressure is, uh, sorry, uh, left atrial pressure is high or not. It's going to affect decisions you make on fluid balance, on diuresis, on deciding whether the left ventricle needs some help in, in forward flow, uh, seeing the response to interventions. It can explain weaning failure. So we do think it's a really important question for critically ill patients. Um, this is just a quick case that, it, illustrates um, some of the differences between what comprehensive echo will answer and what a hemodynamic scan will answer. And this touches on two of our questions really. First, valve disease, which Mark has talked about, and also a bit of left atrial pressure as well. So um, this, uh, this is actually the image you've seen before of a mitral stenosis patient, but I had a patient uh, a couple of weeks ago with an almost identical image to this. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't save it, so I've borrowed Marcus's image. Uh, the only difference is the mitral stenosis was probably a bit worse. And this uh, uh, quite young uh, patient had been getting more and more breathless over the last five or so years. She'd had a diagnosis of asthma, and then she came into hospital with the respiratory failure, she had the typical medical treatment of asthma treatment, COPD treatment, infection treatment, and pulmonary edema treatment. And you know, the combination of those things did actually make her better over the course of the night. Um, but I was able to scan her the, the, the following morning and immediately he saw that she had a massive left, left atrium and she had what was quite bad mitral stenosis. And it became, you know, instantly very obvious that the cause of her breathlessness over the last several years was in fact mitral stenosis and not asthma. Um, and what, what were the questions I was asking myself here? Did I want to be able to grade her mitral stenosis? Did I want to decide whether it was moderate or severe? No, that was really not relevant to the uh, treatment that I was going to give her. Um, did I want to know whether the left atrial pressure was high or not? Yes. And now mitral stenosis itself confounds all the normal measurements you take for diastology. And in fact, the left ventricle normally 
relaxes extremely well in mitral stenosis. It's not affected very much. It's pressure backwards that's more of an issue. But you can see with a big left atrium and B lines on ultrasound, you, you know, pulmonary capillary pressures are high and there's pulmonary edema, and that's the reason. So that's just a little case to, it, to illustrate the differences between uh, what the clinical questions we're asking ourselves in critical care. Okay, and then we come on to, I mean, it's, it's difficult to rank the importance of these questions, isn't it? They're all important. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the right ventricle is very important in critical care. Um, and we've got a lot of RV enthusiast friends who probably tell you it's more important than the LV, uh, but it's certainly as important. Uh, and why is it a particular focus on intensive care? Well, fluid balance, uh, positive pressure, ventilation, um, any disease that causes respiratory failure, uh, all can have significant impacts on the right side of the heart. And so that becomes really important to, to, to monitor and assess on anyone who's acutely unwell. So with FICE, you get taught to recognise uh, RV overload, and there's no distinction between volume and pressure overload. You just taught to recognize a dilated right ventricle. And you're even taught to look at its longitudinal function by looking at tapsy. And we're going into this a bit further with uh, hemodynamics because it's so important. So we are uh, learning here how to visually assess fractional area change. We're not doing any fancy measurements of it, but we're looking uh, at the size of the right ventricle and diastole and then systole and, and visually coming up with an impression of that fractional area change. We're looking at longitudinal function with TAPSI, but also with uh, tissue Doppler. And we're looking at the uh, shape of the interventricular septum, the timing of whether when it's squashed or not, to so distinguish between volume and pressure overload. And we're also uh, looking at um, pulmonary artery pressures as well. Again, another important uh, part of the puzzle in a critically ill patient. You know, knowing the well, side of ventilatory strategies. Sorry, deciding on ventilatory strategies, deciding on uh, fluid balance. Um, really important so we can uh, just put some Doppler through the tricuspid valve and measure the velocity of any regurge and if it's very low that's great if it's very high then we know that um, pulmonary artery pressure is raised and finally we're going to be looking at the right ventricular free wall which you can measure quite easily in the subcostal view to see if it's thickened or not and that's going to tell us if um, pulmonary artery pressure is chronically raised or acutely raised or at least give us a good idea of that you're going to say something marcus yeah ash i was, I was sorry i didn't mean to interrupt uh, uh, but i was just going to say we're not we're not so sort of quantifying pa pressure are we in the sense that uh, we might have done 10 years ago we're just sort of looking for that velocity and is it high or is it low and, and that's that's our indicator to suggest the probability of raised right heart pressure Agreed. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We're not we're not writing a, a, a pressure measurement in our report. We're looking at the probability mm -hmm. of it being high or not. Yeah. Um, then we come on to one of the more exciting diagnoses that you make uh, with ultrasound. And it's exciting because it gives really nice pictures and because it's really time critical and because it's life saving. So with FICE, we're taught to recognise whether there's pericardial fluid or not, but with HD, we want to know if that is affecting hemodynamics. So we're looking at it more closely. And it's really not very hard. So the lowest pressure chambers of the heart are going to be affected first. So that's the right atrium and then the right ventricle, and they're going to be affected when they relax, um, first of all. So uh, that's going to be the right atrium collapsing in left ventricular systole and or, or in, in ventricular systole and the uh, right ventricle collapsing in diastole. 
Um, and you can see from these nice pictures here, um, the right atrium and the right ventricle collapsing in what's quite a large uh, effusion. Um, this uh, was, th these pictures are from uh, uh, an A&E &E patient and the diagnosis was made very, very quickly. And this patient's hypotension and shock rapidly reversed after pericardial drainage. Um, so really satisfying diagnosis, really satisfying to treat and uh, absolutely uh, life-saving. And while people always talk about tamponade being a clinical diagnosis, um, there are lots of echo features of tamponade and you correlate that clinically with the patient in front of you and that gives you your diagnosis. Uh, next slide, please, Marcus. Okay, and we get on to our final question now. And this is where we've already departed from standard echocardiography uh, with our aortic views, but this is where we really um, go into new territory. You, you have standard echocardiography, which looks at the pump, which uh, you know, drives blood around the circuit and accepts the initial turn. Um, but that only tells you about the pump. And yeah, it's been, it's been known for decades that venous congestion uh, impairs organ blood flow and causes uh, organ dysfunction, particularly in the kidneys, which are very susceptible to pressure effects. And uh, you can get an idea of this in intensive care patients from uh, their CVP reading. So uh, the higher the central venous pressure is, the more likely there is to be venous congestion. But we can assess this directly and quite simply with ultrasound. Um, and we can rule this in or out um, quite nicely. So just go back one slide for me, Marcus. The, uh, sure. um, uh, we, we start uh, looking at this by assessing the inferior vena cava. And this is a nice simple bit of the algorithm again. If your IVC is less than two centimeters, you can stop. You know that there is not uh, significantly uh, ray or, or significant venous congestion if the IVC is small. If your IVC is more than two centimeters, then you need to do some further measurements. And you, you do that by interrogating the great veins. And we start with the hepatic vein. And really the hepatic vein waveform is just a, um, a representation of our CVP trace. Um, but instead of our, uh, the AC and V waves that we traditionally talk about, we, we're concentrating on the systolic and diastolic waves, the S and D waves. And you know, normally without venous congestion, the S wave is bigger than the D wave. And as venous congestion progresses, the S wave becomes smaller and eventually ends up being positive above the baseline as, as venous pressures rise. Uh, we then go on to look at the, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we go to the next slide, Marcus, and we can see some pictures of how that changes. So there's the hepatic vein Doppler at the top. You've got the normal one with the S wave being bigger than D. Then the S wave gets smaller and then the S wave reverses. Uh, we then go on to the portal vein and portal venous flow should normally be nice and continuous like most venous flow. And as venous pressures rise, venous flows get more and more pulsatile and you can measure the degree of pulsatility very easily just by measuring the peaks and the troughs. And as pressures rise, it'll get more and more pulsatile, as you can see there in the picture. And then finally, we can look at the uh, blood flow of the kidney directly. And there's these, uh, we can put our pulse wave gates over one of the interloba arteries and veins. And these, are, these small arteries and veins run right next to each other. So it's a, a single sampling point will give you an arterial trace above the line, and then you get the venous trace below the line. And similarly to the other veins, uh, venous flow should be quite continuous. And with increasing venous pressures, um, those flows become uh, interrupted. So you can see in the, in the middle section, there are separate uh, systolic and diastolic 
waves there with no flow in between them. And then when venous pressures get very high, you'll just end up getting blood flow in diastole. And this really, uh, uh, you know, helps us with management. We've had this erroneous idea for years that renal failure in ill patients is nearly always due to pre-renal causes and they get more and more fluid. And actually, uh, all you're going to do is make the situation worse in a lot of cases because you'll make venous pressures worse, venous congestion higher, and you'll make the kidney function worse. So this is really, if you're, if you're going to talk about hemodynamics and you're not looking at the venous system, then you've really not got the full picture. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, the final thing to mention about those is, is that you um, can put all that in a scoring system, which has been uh, validated, the references down there. Um, it, it's not as complicated as it looks. You just, uh, you're just looking at the, how abnormal the flows are in each of the veins, and then you plug that in and you get a grade of congestion. Uh, and I think now we're just gonna go on to the accreditation process. Thanks, Ash. Okay, so this is a busy slide, but we're going to break it down. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about the prerequisites and then hand over to you, Ash, for a bit. So look, um, there are some, first of all, you know, you've got to be familiar with assessing patients clinically, okay? You have to be somebody who does that and interprets all the signs, the physical signs, the, the clinical information there. So you have to be a clinician, and that doesn't mean you have to be a doctor. You just have to be someone who's familiar and comfortable with all of those things because it's all integration um, to reach the right decision. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is you need to have done some ultrasound before. And, and you know, we, we've set out some uh, basic level of, uh, cardiac ultrasound. Uh, that's currently FUSIC HD, sorry, FUSIC heart, as was well FICE, uh, or BSE level one, plus uh, either the combination of lung and abdomen, uh, called it a FUSIC, or the famous, uh, which is the focus to keep medicine ultrasound training system that looks a lot uh, very similar to how QSIC uh, was before we made it all modular and you know that's important because you need to be able to scan the heart well uh, in order to be able to then go on and learn these other more advanced um, uh, modalities and, and, and have demonstrated competence in that. Um, Ash why don't you take me through the, the, the program components there fella. Yeah so we've tried to keep this um, uh, in the same format as the other uh, fusic modules so you register with the ICS uh, you find a course to go on and then you do a logbook with cemented practice now it's probably worth talking about the number of scans that we do here mm. so for BSE level two you do 250 scans for EDIC it's uh, uh, 150 or 185 including the TOE um, so why if there are if there's advanced stuff here is only 50 scans? Well, the answer is it's not just 50 scans. So the prerequisites for this are that you already have to be FICE accredited, which is at least 50 scans on its own. So that already takes us up to 100. The prerequisite is also that you can do lung ultrasound. So you've done that accreditation. So you've done all the images required for that and for abdomen as well. So actually to, to even be able to embark on this, you need to be uh, quite good at ultrasound um, and you'll be quite experienced already. Um, so we are confident that people with that level of experience already will find it relatively straightforward to learn the additional advanced things they need to learn and we think 50 scans will be enough for that. And we're going to find that out very easily because of the fact that there's going to be a, a an exam a centrally run assessment so uh you'll have to come and uh, uh show us your logbook bring some video cases for us to look at and be questioned on there'll be a pathology some pathology images which you'll get asked questions on and we're going to watch you perform a full hd examination as well to prove that you can do it so if you come and show us that you can do it, then you're clearly competent. Um, so that's the criteria uh, yeah. we've decided on uh, to, 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 to start with. 
So we try to keep the structure the same as all the other modules we've had, okay? So that's um, having a, a supervisor and a mentor. And for those of you that are familiar with that, you'll know that the supervisor is like the, the expert, the sort of the final stage, the, the governance, uh, quality assurance stage, if you like. And that mentor is the person that does a lot of the kind of hands-on training at the bedside. And that's worked very well for cardiac and uh, for non-cardiac stuff, actually. But um, clearly here, we're now fusing the two. And that's where it starts to get a bit more interesting. We've, we've kept those two uh, requirements, the supervisor and the mentor, but, um, but actually the difference between them is probably less important the more uh, emphasis you have on an examination assessment at the end, I think. So we've decided to get head off like this. You'll see uh, the familiar signs of, of cardiology uh, expertise and accreditation, uh, inclusive of EDEC actually for this, but also you'll see that there's a sort of there's a radiology side of this, which, um, you know, at the moment we've looked to radiologists and orographers and intensivists with experience and expertise. And um, but we sort of we still think that's important. That's going to be very important in the early stages of, of uh, its development. But I think as you look back at FICE now and see the many hundreds and hundreds of uh, FICE practitioners around uh, that the, the expertise is moving into intensive care. And as time goes on, we'll all be ultrasonologists um, uh, of our patients, looking at all of them from head to toe. And I think, you know, we've seen a massive change in the last 10 years. We'll see another massive change in 10 years to come. And I think our experts will, of the future will be internal. So you, th this is a very similar um, story here for mentors, um, but, um, you know, we're, we're going to be at the steep part of the curve here, but as we go on, we're hoping to, to see that um, become more widespread. And by the way, if any of this proves to be unworkable, then we'll change it, you know, if we uh, if we if we need to. So uh, again, all of this is going to be under tight review, and part of the difficulty is trying to uh, project something about the future of a of accreditation without having done it and putting it into publication before was a decision we made was really to try and generate awareness and a structure, and uh, only time will tell, um, you know, how easy that is to put into place. But I, I, I'm optimistic it will be with all the experts we have around this. It just leaves me to say uh, thank you to all of our committee members and the co-authors here. Um, all of you are very valued members of this team and had input into this document. We really appreciate it. There's one person I want to make a personal um, a thank to, and that's my good friend Sharon Kay, a professor of echocardiography over in Sydney. We would wish she was on that list and she's very much a, a friend and spiritual mentor and guide to, to this process. And we value it very, very uh, much. So thank you, Sharon, for the, your input into this so far and ongoing support. Um, we've gone over an hour. Um, and uh, I know that JKB, you've been quietly in the background um, looking at the questions. And I, I, I'm, I'm really bringing you back in with a, with a smile to hope that we haven't offended you by going uh, long. But I think, I hope you'll agree it's been interesting and entertaining and I'm sure you're going to have lots of very difficult questions for us so make sure you ask us easy ones and keep the difficult ones to yourself okay so over to you JKB. Thank you, Thank you very much gentlemen as you can see I've I've come out in uh, in in support with a Fusic HD Lego background um, I don't think anybody's going to complain that you overran because it was pretty compelling and, and interesting and it's nice to see that it's sort of set for the future um, I suppose the first question is how long do you think that people are going to take to do this? Let's imagine that you've got your Fusic heart, what was FICE, under your belt, and you've done some lung arch sound and done the abdo modules and things like that. To do these 50 scans, all those bits of balls, what do you think is the time frame going to be? I think it's going to take a year. It's going to take a year because, you know, these scans aren't, they're not quick and easy five minute scans. These are, these are, Deep, deep scans going into lots of stuff. So, you know, I think it's going to take uh, a reasonable time to go through one study, <clears throat> but that's not a bad thing. You know, all time spent is is time growing and becoming, um, you know, better and better at it. We've seen that with, uh, you know, the first level scanning starting from absolutely nothing to at the end of that 50 cases being pretty solid, I think. And most people I know that have done that, uh, it seems to be really, you know, I'm, I'm very confident with them working in and around me and my patients. Ash, what do you think? Yeah, it depends on the motivation of the uh, person doing it, doesn't it? So if you're doing uh, level two, that's 250 scans in two years. So, and actually people end up 
having to do more scans than that because to, to meet all the requirements. So, you know, that's maybe 150 scans a year that they're doing. So you could do it. You could do this in six months, um, but it depends on your circumstances. You, you need to have access to machines and the patients You need to have time. You know, it depends if you're a trainee or a consultant, um, but it's very, very doable. I, I, I suspect like Marcus says, it'll be realistically, it'll be a year for a lot of people, but there's no reason it can't be done quicker than that. And so on that basis, then, if you think that it's going to take about a year, when do you propose that the first exams are going to be? <laughs> what a great question. I love that. I, I, I'm going to say 12 months from now. What do you think, Ash? I'm going to say uh, maybe maybe after the pandemic settles down and uh, no, but we'll, we'll be monitoring that really closely. Uh, Justin, good question. And, uh, you know, we we we. Um, We've got some time to prepare for that, and so, but prepare we will. And uh, I think we'll be looking at twelve months from here, don't you think, Ash? Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll keep a close eye on how many people are, uh, are registering, and we certainly uh, won't leave people hanging who've been working on their logbooks and then and then are waiting to do an exam. So, um, yeah, I think a year is uh, sounds about right to me. Okay, so and just to remind people then in that case, what's the minimum training level required to undertake this if we get going on the HD roadmap? So you need to be vice positive already or BSC level one positive. Um, you need to be lung ultrasound accredited, fusic accredited and abdomen or uh, you've done the acute medicine routes by doing famous which is uh, lung and abdomen in, in, in there okay um so obviously you've talked about supervisors and stuff and so there are people who are listening in this evening who've got colleagues who've been using echo and critical ill patients uh they've done the programs they're actually doing stuff that's already got the diffusing hd components in and beyond valves assessments pisa pressure half times so on and now getting vexus and stuff like that. So is the committee going to be uh, welcoming and flexible for these people who've got all these extra skills and, and, and how are you gonna get them on board? Absolutely, yes, is the answer to that. Um, we couldn't have done FICE without people like that. The early adopters who were willing to put their hand up and join us in helping uh, train other people. And uh, so, yeah, a hundred percent. Yes. We've always had that. Um, I, I grandfathering is a word. Sometimes people look at in a negative way. I don't actually, I think it's a rec recognition of expertise and outside of existing accreditation programs, which is the case for most of us at this point. So yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, please do email the fire secretariat and uh, make yourselves known and we'll have a process for that for sure. It'll be a committee based decision, but exactly as it always has been for, uh, for FICE and, and for QSIC and then now yeah, FUSIC. So, yes, absolutely. Ash, do you have anything to add there? Uh, no, I just uh, I just echo what you say. I can I, I mm. completely agree with that. We uh, uh, And we want all the support that people are willing to offer. It's a lot of time for the trainers and uh, you know, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. So please do help out. And obviously getting many people who are in that position then will eliminate one of the rate limiting features uh, of, of getting more people through. So a cascade effect, we assume then. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there are um, intensive cares around the country, uh, this country and others, where everybody has got Fusic Heart or an equivalent and, and stuff like that. I dream of that, maybe one day. <laughs> Um, but what do you anticipate for the future then? Do you think that everybody who has done, you know, the basic hemodynamic sort of music heart stuff would go on and do this? Or do you think it's going to be a bit like the top of that, uh, that pyramid like BOC2? What do you think it's going to turn out to be? Ash, Ash what do you think? You, you take that one first. So I was just typing, okay. it, I was typing an answer to another question, so I didn't hear it at all. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, so, the, so the question is, do we think, uh, where does FISIC HD sit in the kind of pyramid of things? And, you know, is it going to be a, a high adoption, high volume thing, or is it going to be a very low volume thing as the kind of pinnacle of, so, so I think, um, look, you know, BSC level two is clearly the pinnacle of this triangle and it absolutely deserves its place there. Uh, you know, for people that can afford the time and the energy to, to do that, they, they should be congratulated at, at that achievement. And they are the experts of the future. So there's no question about that. HD sits definitely in the middle. Uh, I don't think everybody who does FICE will, will want to do that necessarily or have the time. But I think it's really, really useful because those skills are really where there's a huge amount of gains to be had. And, what's, what, and what I haven't mentioned so far is that they're they're often difficult to get clinically. And I think that's the big thing. When Ash and I were deciding what questions to answer, we really did try and look at what, what are, what, what, if we can get something from clinical assessment and it's easy, well, that's no problem. But um, a lot of the questions here are not easy to get and are frequently missed unless you look. And so uh, hopefully that will stir people on uh, to want to extend their skill set and take these things in. And I do hope it, it establishes itself in the, in the middle ground in terms of uh, uptake and deliverability. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty positive about that. I think people will want to do it. Ash, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, you know, FICE is, FICE is really useful for managing intensive care patients. And lung ultrasound is incredibly useful for managing intensive care patients. Um, but hemodynamics, uh, it, hemodynamics are just a, such a crucial a core part of intensive care practice and how do you assess them properly unless you unless you want to be putting swans in people all the time and your uh, which requires a high level of expertise to interpret all that stuff um you know i, I don't know how you do this without ultrasound and and i'm sure this will become just standard normal intensive care practice uh, in, in the years to come and people will look back and be amazed that um, people didn't used to know how to do it in the part that you talked about who you get to help you you've talked about um, looking at those people in areas for supervision so we talked about radiologists and the BAC level two people so you may end up working in a unit somewhere where you don't have a BSC level two person and you may not have those direct ties with radiology. So what's the best way forward there? Because presumably there may be likely to be some BSC level two people in cardiology or echocardiography. How would you, how would you get people to sort of embark on that journey then? They may have the, the prerequisites that you've outlined of, done but how are they going to push forwards to expand that to those other departments to help? Them? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, it's so heartbreaking to hear stories where people can't progress into these areas because of uh, limited supply of that sort of uh, support. So, you know, I do understand where these questions are coming from. And the answer is, of course, but, you know, this is brand new, you know, uh, very few radiologists know about parenchymal lung ultrasound, as, um, as everyone here will probably know. So, you know, are they the best supervisors? I'm not sure they are necessarily for the lung in the way we talk about a lung ultrasound. Um, similarly, you know, uh, do they do venous uh, ultrasound in the same way? I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And I think the fact that we've made this uh, an assessment by examination rather than a triggered local assessment does give us a great deal of bit more well, flexibility around this stuff and um, whereas FICE always relies on that um, high level expertise to, to, to authenticate that um, final decision I think we can afford to keep our eye closely on this ball and maybe change things around if it really proves to be impossible and I can tell you there's a lot of will from us and the people in the committee to help uh, support people in areas like uh, that you just described there JKB and, uh, and, the, and the person asking the question and um, I, I do think as we go forward, if we're talking about the next five years, probably even the next year, we're going to see a lot more um, remote supervision. The technology is coming online where these can be done you know, remotely and, uh, and then assessed in examination. That may be the way we, you know, we, we may have to reconsider the whole role of that supervisor in time. So 
I don't know if that answers your question. I think I can absolutely see your point and the concerns raised, but I think there are always ways around this uh, where there's enough determination and, and uh, that's where I'm at right now. And I'm hoping that we'll get another one final question, maybe from the audience, but I'm just going to slip one in as well whilst we're waiting, because I, I had the uh, the benefit of seeing your slide set earlier and stuff, and it raises lots of questions. What about um, image governance and things like that? So if you think about what the echo text, et cetera, are putting on, on their systems to upload and what the radiologists are putting on their systems, this is sort of uh, the love child of both systems. So how do you think we're going to have an image governance process for that? Where is it going to sit? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an important question. Um, yeah. We have uh, mentioned uh, governance in the article and we've also dealt with it in the GPIX uh, version two. There's the whole uh, chapter in that on ultrasound, uh, which goes through the governance structures. Uh, you're right, uh, ideally scans should be uploaded onto a central system and uh, you know you should do whatever you can locally to facilitate that process. It, it is slowly becoming more straightforward as technology improves and as other departments recognise that point of care ultrasound is getting done more and more um, so solutions do exist um, but you know you need to have good local governance structures to uh, ensure that you're doing this stuff uh, safely and uh, you know in a professional way thank you Great. well that's all of the questions that people are, have put to us i think the last thing for me to say is to say Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been fascinating. Um, as I said, you've always pointed us towards the article that's in Jigsaw at the end as well. So if we want to have a look at it, that's available uh, for free, of course. So Jigsaw is available for free um, at, on there. So it's in sort of open domain, as it were. Um, and of course, both of you are pretty active on Twitter, social media as well. So I'm sure there may be some active dialogue. So yeah, there we go. ICM teaching for Ashley and IC ultrasonic, uh, ICU ultrasonic uh, for you, isn't it, Marcus? Um, and yes, I look is, forward yeah. to having a look at people ask you some questions about that. And um, it seems to be that the future of point of care ultrasound and intensive care is bright. It's not orange, but it's black and white with a bit of colour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thanks for everyone Thank for you, Justin. For along. Yeah. Bye bye all. Thanks everybody for listening. Bye. Bye.